All right, here we go. Let's uh, start with a prayer. The Lord be with you. Oh, God, so with you. Gracious, loving God, thank you for life and love and for having community to <laughs> walk with us as we journey through this world. Um, we're in pain. We, this is a time when we need each other, when we need to be together, when we need to share and listen. Because the, the tragedy in Boulder um, isn't new for us. It's personal. We, we know what this is like because we've been through it so many times here in Colorado. And so we ask for peace. We ask for hope. We ask for you to um, stir your spirit so strongly in us and in others that these types of things through our ability to love and serve and, and be generous, that these types of things will finally end. We don't want our kids and, and teachers afraid to go to school. We don't want people afraid to go to church or to a movie theater or um, to the grocery store. We want to be able to do life and without the fear of violence or terrorism. And so help us, Lord. Fill us. Uh, don't make us to be judgmental and mean. Make us to be people who seek solutions who seek ways of creating life that generates life for all people so that we and all the world may experience real life in Jesus name. Amen. Oh all right. So we are in, uh, this is our last session we're talking about uh, the book here uh, next month. You'll pivot to something else. What is the topic next month, Cheryl? A way of life. Uh, it's by, um, and I don't have it in front of me, but uh, McLaren. And oh, it dovetails right into what we've just talking about because it talks about migrating from this belief system that you it's you have to do this 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 and this and migrating to a church of love versus a church of rules and regulations. Fantastic. Susan, do you have anything else? She's going to lead next week. So what would you have to add to that? Um, nothing yet because I'm going to buy, go by church today to pick okay. up the stuff you left for me. I just got home last night. So I don't know anything yet. So don't expect too much. And please pray for us, Pastor Doug. Yes. Well, I will, I will pray for you and I will make you an offer that yes. if you, if you run into something that you need unpacked or, or uh, just discussed a little deeper level, uh, feel free to invite me into that conversation. I'd love to, oh, great. to jump okay. on. I, ca I can't engage every week, but um, if there are some questions or things where you want kind of my viewpoint into it, I I'd be happy to, to intervene. Okay. And the good news okay. is there's a DVD section that we watch each week and then they've provided questions. So Cheryl and great. I should, yeah. you know, we're going to facilitate, right? We're not. Yes. Uh -huh. we're, anything. Yeah. we're just facilitating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're hoping that Pastor Pat will kind of keep us on the right track, too. <laughs> of course she will. Of course. <laughs> she won't let, us, so she much. won't let us go too far off the... Uh... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, that's great. Brian McLaren's the real deal. Um, he is in one of the leaders in our camp of, of uh, innovative, progressive theology. Um, and he's one of these pioneers who... Uh, has stepped out <clears throat> and, and made bold statements about where the church uh, needs to move and, and what faith in Christ really is about. So Brian is involved with uh, Richard Rohr down at the Center for Action and Contemplation. Uh, Brian, um, when Rick Barger wrote his book back in the uh, beginning of the, of the 21st century, Man, it's hard. I have to say it like that now. It's almost 20 years ago <laughs> yeah, when Rick yeah. was working on his book. Uh, Brian and Rick was speaking at a lot of gatherings and events. Brian was just coming out at that time too uh, with, with his writing and, and work. And, um, and they overlapped with a lot Actually, of activities, events. So Brian knows, he knows us at Abiding Hope, knows what we're about. If, if you want to glance through it before Susan picks it up, it's in uh, the, uh, Pastor Laura's mailbox. Oh, cool. But Susan's going to need to stop by and pick it up at some time. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. You come get it, Susan. I can always get a, a copy. It's great. Okay. I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're reading that book together. 
So as we uh, dive in here this last week, we, we were to read chapter six along with the epilogue and the appendices. Um, very exciting reading, you know, especially the, the covenant with Christ the King. Very yeah. exciting, dynamic oh, yeah. work. Um, but I, I would love to hear some of your, um, chapter six was about the other models of Anchor Church. The one that we're uh, focused on at Abiding Hope is polysite, and uh, which are small uh, I say in the book, 10 to 30, I've, I've been saying more lately, 15 to 30 people uh, in a small community of, of, of relationship, and they choose to do church how they want to do church. And the point is not for them to grow in number, but to grow deeper in relationship and then multiply and help us to multiply. And so the vision is to have a bunch of these poly sites and they can be anywhere in the country. They don't have to be here because we have technology. So Suzanne, mm -hmm. who is on this call is sitting in Payson, Arizona. And as mm -hmm. soon as we get this COVID thing under control, I'm going down there. I had my first shot. As soon as I get my second shot, I'm going to Arizona. And I'm gonna meet with this little community of folks that the Zens have gathered around them. Um, down there, they've been watching Abiding Hope's worship. They gather for meals and uh, fellowship and spend time together. And that's exactly what we're talking about with poly site. And, and I think that's the future of the church, to be honest with you. I don't think the future of the church or big mega places will have those and people will go there from time to time. But I think the future are smaller communities where people can actually do life together. And, and that models what we saw in the early church. Um, uh, and it models what we saw with um, the Celtic church um, uh, in, in, in Ireland, England, those areas when it was being developed. So there's, there's history in, in the church for this type of a movement. And I'm excited. I'm, I'm most excited about polycyte than I am anything else because I think that's going to have staying power. Yeah, Susan. So how do I, as a new member at Abiding Hope, become part of something like that? Or is that something as... I need to gather people of my own around. Well, that's a great question. So small groups are different from poly site communities, okay. right? So a small group is part of the Abiding Hope um, main community or, or primary community, I should say. Uh, and so people who are in small groups also come to the church for worship and they come there for fellowship and other things. A poly site, those folks would never come to the church. They don't ever come to Abiding Hope. They would, well, once in a while. Yeah, I'll get to you in a second, Sue. Yeah, but what they do is they meet where they want to meet, at home schools, um, coffee shops. Uh, some groups could be just outdoor-based. They did meet in nature, gather in nature, have some worship thing that they do, and then do a hike or, or you know, plant trees or do something else. So it's, a, it's a, a really different expression of the church. So as a member of Abiding Hope, I would say, you don't need to do that unless that's the expression of church you want to experience. If you're, okay. if you're content coming to the church and being part of our worship life and everything, fantastic. But if you're someone who, not really, I, I want less tradition. I, I, want, I want to be surrounded by people that I'm with all the time and can go deeper with. Um, that's what polysite really is about. Um, it's an answer to people who have been disenfranchised from the church. People who have been wounded and hurt, um, people who who um, really only want to be with a few folks to do to go deep in life with versus you know the the full expression of how we experience uh, church. So it's 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 very different. Does that make sense? Did I answer your question, yeah. there, Susan? Yeah. Except then I need to I need to figure out how I plug into a small group. Yeah, yeah. we're going to get you in a small group. That that will happen. Mm -hmm. We got to get that going, Susan. I just wanted to give you a little bit of history of how this happened. When our church closed in March a year ago, we were very disenfranchised as a result. That's a different story, but it began when Roger and I watched the first video. It was Palm Sunday, I think, that we saw Abiding Hope's first video. We have a young couple, young, they're 53. Uh, <laughs> you're still young. That's my age. Yeah. They have become our adopted kids here in Payson, and we said, you've got to come watch this with us. And then they said, oh, that was so cool to have more than just two people sitting on a couch watching. We actually worshipped. Then it began to spiral to now we have 
almost every week, 15 coming. Some have gone back to churches that have opened around the community, but they continue to come here because of the message that they hear on Abiding Hope's videos. But it's a mix now of a worship service and dinner for 15 to 18 people. 18 is kind of our table max <laughs> until, <laughs> until the weather gets warmer and we can go back outside. But we are facing the situation that I guess all churches think is a good one. We're, we're running out of space. And I liked what you said, Pastor Doug, about maybe it's just out in the woods on a hike where you have your own worship service. But we also have the only house that has the big screen TV that can show the video. A couple of our other members have houses big enough that I have to get over there and teach them how to get the video onto their TV. <laughs> so it's an interesting, complex situation, but very, very exciting. Half of our group, this is their church now. The other half go to their church worship services. And they've all scattered around the community to different churches, sadly. But uh, they go to church on Sunday morning, and then ours is usually Saturday evening or Sunday evening. We alternate weeks. It's a fabulous experience. And we're grateful that you plan to keep on doing the videos when the Abiding Hope Church. And some of our group is planning to go with us to visit Abiding Hope, the mother church. <laughs> we're going to come up in the fall, we hope, to, to actually worship at the church with you. Very cool. Very cool. And I've already offered to Sue when that group comes. Um, I'd love to have do some Bible study stuff with them and some engagement stuff with them. We'll find a way to integrate some Abiding Hope folks here with that group and, and build some do some relationship building. We'll figure that out. But do you see we're experimenting? And we're, 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 we're looking at potential models for how we can be church and be faithful church, not just, you know, there's an old joke about... Um, a guy gets marooned on a deserted island and and he's there for for 20 years and and the uh they finally rescue him and and you know he doesn't want to leave right away he said well wait a second i've been living here 20 years i've built all this i built a little town here let me take you for a walk through my town and they're like wait you're the only person here right yeah but you know i wanted to have life kind of normal and so he says this is my little house my little hut that i built and over here is the store the little town store that I, I keep all my spies in and go there when I get things. And, and, and here's the church. I built my church, but then uh, there's a church on the other side of his house. And they said, well, what about that other church? He goes, yeah, the pastor at the first church made me angry. So I joined that second church oh. <laughs> halfway through. So, you know, it, it's church is a church is an interesting thing. And some of us have in our minds that this is exactly what church is supposed to look like, right? Whatever, whatever my idea for church is. And, and there are folks who demand that that's what church should be. You know, got to have candles on the altar. You've got to have, um, you know, pastors in robes. You got to have, you know, all this, you have this set idea. And we need to get out of that mindset and recognize what Jesus really was about. Mm -hmm. And that was creating a culture of life for all people. And so we need to experiment and find ways of living that culture that then help for that culture, <clears throat> excuse me, to spill out into the world. That's the point. Remember at the very beginning of the book, the goal is not to get everybody to come to church. The goal is to draw people into the Jesus way of life that produces life for all people. And the majority of folks won't ever step foot in a church. They will be affected and enculturated by participation with us, relationships with us. But we're the ones who are the culture makers, the cultural architects that are called to build this culture at home, school, neighborhood, at work, wherever we go to draw the world into it. So I'm excited about the different expressions that can develop out of this. And it has to be organic. Go ahead, Pat. Another thing that has happened over the years, this happened 20 years ago. You know, we're Lutheran. And uh, yeah. there were two other Lutheran churches in town. A couple left our church and went to the Presbyterian church. Oh, that's now, just blasphemy. No, no, no. It, it's okay if they went to one of the other Lutheran churches. We understood, you know, that was 20 years ago. Yeah. So that's kind of falling away too. 
that mm-hmm. got to be Lutheran. You know, I was raised Lutheran. I'm going to die Lutheran. Yeah, denominationalism is dead. Uh, there, there are a few of us who are, you know, we, 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 we refuse to give up the ghost, as my grandfather used to say. But um, denominationalism is dead. When we took the name Lutheran off the church, we got far more people coming in than when we had Lutheran on the name. Um, because people aren't looking for denominational um, I mean, if I were to move somewhere else um, and not be a pastor, let, let me be clear. If I were just to move, retire, move somewhere else, I'd check out the Lutheran Church. But let me tell you, if, if they weren't in line theologically with where I am, I'm not staying there. I'm going to go find another church where I don't have to do a lot of work to bring them on board. But I can, I can you know, be in line with how they teach, preach, and, and, and practice their faith in the world. But the denomination wouldn't matter so much to me. Um, and the nice thing about being ELCA, if you're LCMS, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and a retired pastor, you have to have membership in an LCMS church to get your pension. Really? Because that's, that's oh. terrible. That's terrible. And, but to be ELCA, that is not the case. Um, so I could be Presbyterian, Episcopalian. I could even be Roman Catholic. Oh, my goodness. Ooh, Yay. You know, right. Okay. That is just the heresy in a Lutheran <laughs> church for a pastor to say that. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess I'm wondering, like when we moved here, um, my husband and I were Episcopalian. Um, I was actually raised Russian Orthodox. Wow. Um, but when we moved, as we moved, um, we didn't always have a Russian Orthodox church available to us as I was growing up. So then our, my mom's priest had told her to, that the Anglican church was, was sufficient. <laughs> people whatever and um so we started going to we lived in germany so we went to the anglican church there and then um uh when we moved back to the states we went to the episcopal church well when we moved here we went to the episcopal church but it was very small and our um for us it was about where our children are going to fit in mm-hmm. i mean is that what we find people looking for is where their children are going to fit in because mm-hmm. that was yes. At my age at that time, that's what I was looking for. Yes, that's why our target is women between the ages of 30 and 45, um, mm-hmm. is, is because that's the concern, is I, I want my kids to have faith. I want my kids to learn about Jesus. I want my kids to have a theological foundation. Um, and and we're, we're, we recognize that motivation, and we're, we're addressing that motivation, because I think that's significant. Um, you know, if you look at, you look at society throughout history, the women are really the society builders. They, the, the men were the ones who were, you know, the heads of corporation or government or whatever, but it was women who created the practices of culture and society within the homes, even within the church community and so forth. And um, that's still the case. It's definitely the case. And, and, and so our target is not a man 30 to 45 it's a woman 30 to 45 because she she has influence with her husband and she her motivation is her children um and and so we we honor that and we respect that and we are addressing that motivation yeah it's interesting because now i'm looking for um like the theology piece of it yeah and we evolve yeah yeah because it was a really hard change i was one of those I had my leather bound book of common prayer that was in my car at all times kind of okay. thing. And it was really hard to become a member and now call myself a Lutheran for a while. You, you can call yourself anything you want. Well, um, right. you, you, you know, come, come, come up with something that it says Orthodox, Anglican, Episcopal, Lutheran, yeah, you know, I'm just in, a, in there. I'm a mismatch yeah. of all yeah, kinds. Barb, Barb, Barb's a Catholic. Yeah. You know, she, she, she's yeah, our, our resident. Baha'i, Kath there you go. There you yeah. go. Oh, and you're, Muslims thing too. Yeah. Well, if you're Bahai, you're all of it, right? Yeah. Because yeah, right. they, they, they incorporate it all. But um, the point I was going to make here a second ago, oh, Orthodox. A lot of my theology um, is affected by the Eastern Orthodox theology. So uh, the economic trinity versus the ontological trinity that I mentioned in my uh, in the theology part of the book, um, that's Eastern that Orthodox. That's Eastern Orthodox. That's not, that's the West was the one, what was the church body that wanted to define God within God's self. The East said, we'll never be able to do that. Let's talk about how God functions in our participation in that. 
and and that's where I'm basing my theology is more Eastern than Western. You know, I didn't know you had to, I need to talk to you sometime about your Russian Orthodox oh, yeah. her, heritage. It was fascinating. That's great. Um, uh, uh, any questions about any aspect of those other models that the adoption model is a church takes over a struggling church and makes it a multi-site, you know, another site. Um, um, uh, franchise model is multi-sites, but they all look exactly the same. And you usually you have a rock star pastor that is streamed into all of the locations. Um, you have site pastors and worship leaders and such, but that rock star, it, it really is a cult of personality. Th those franchise models, you have one centralized person that everything is really built around. And, and they're successful. I mean, they really are successful. The problem is and we see- We attended I, let, let one me, of those in Florida and that was very interesting. We oh, went to the main ch uh, church, but you know, they took us to their uh, communication room where they had these places all over that were ready to listen to the pastor. They were all over a Miami area, but also offsite in other locations, but mm -hmm. he was it. Yeah. Yeah. He's the man. Don't and they get, those are, those are the churches that get big name musicians and all the, you know, every week you go, there's a celebrity there, somebody that that's being featured or whatever. The problem is in those, what we see is when the, that, that dynamic leader leaves, um, often it falls apart uh, because or, it's, it's difficult to follow that person. Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Or isn't it, isn't there a, isn't there the fear of elevating that person to a place that's um, more in a God kind of, you know, you're following that person rather than actually worshiping God. We, we that's our critique, right? That that's how, we critique uh, those settings that way. Um, I don't know that that's that's always a fair um, critique. I think that, um, you know, like, do you know who Mike Householder is? Mm -hmm. You know that name? No. So so Mike is the pastor of the largest ELCA congregation. It's in. Um, uh, West Des Moines, Iowa, Hope Lutheran. Uh, Mike took over back in the, I think it was the early 80s. It was, it was a congregation that was in Des Moines and um, the, the suburb of West Des Moines was just getting started and the, the, the congregation that he was at was failing, that he got called into was failing. And so through the synod, they decided to move it out to the, the suburban area that was developing and, and rename it and do a, a restart. And so it, he didn't start the congregation from scratch. He kind of had a group of people, but not a large group of people. And it was a new invention of sorts, but Mike's been there his whole career. And uh, you don't know his name. He, he's not a celebrity, but in West Des Moines, he's a rock star. And, and uh, I, I think they have five or six sites now and they're all the same. And Mike is streamed into all of them. But, you know, he's not a Joel Osteen he, who, you know, your best life, um, uh, God wants you to be prosperous. God wants you to be successful. And, you know, Joel bought, bought the, uh, the old um, uh, Astrodome in, in Houston. And, and, you know, it's a big production and televised all around the world and all this stuff. And, yeah, I think there is a threat of people becoming godlike themselves and people worshiping them versus God. But I think it's also possible for like a Mike Householder to be a faithful leader and not make it about him, but make it about, you know, Christ and mission. And, but yet he is that rock star at Hope Lutheran in West Des Moines. Um, well, that, oh, was it Schuler in the Crystal Cathedral? Robert uh, Schuler. Yeah. yeah, when he, when he left, I mean, that fell apart totally. It's now a Catholic church. Yeah, they sold it to the Catholic Church. Um, there was a part of the problem was um, who was going to succeed him, right? Was it going to be his son? Was it going to be his daughter? There were problems with his son um, and things just fell apart. And now it, it doesn't even exist anymore. It's a it's a it's a Catholic cathedral now. Not not. And, and wasn't Schuler. He was either United Church of Christ or Presbyterian. One of the two. He was in a denomination. Yeah, he was. He was in a denomination. Yeah. But we see these. Around the country, uh, Rick Warren at Saddleback Church in California, um, 
in the Lutheran Church, we had Community of Joy in Glendale, Arizona. That that's no longer a big, big, big church. It 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 went way down. So it's hard to sustain those models. Those those are tough to really sustain, especially once that very dynamic personality leaves. Yeah. So so chapter six discussed those um, models, and then the epilogue. What's next? I, I just give some ideas for where I think uh, the church needs to go. I think we need to align seminaries. We need to align synods. We need to align congregations, uh, the whole denomination holistically, if we're going to have lasting change. But I don't see that happening in the denomination. I don't, <coughs> I don't think it happens, <coughs> excuse me, in most <coughs> mainline denominations. The seminaries are kind of independent, and then you got congregations that are independent, and then the synods or dioceses or whatever are doing their own thing. And we don't have a holistic vision or strategy for how we're going to move into this new culture, new way of life within the church. And I'm advocating for that. Um, we're in conversation with Trinity Seminary now. I don't know if they're going to accept our offer to make the seminary home base for anchor church work. Uh, that's what we want to do. We want to recreate the, the, the curriculum so that students are being educated in this and yeah. that um, the focus is congregational vitality. I want to create the reputation at the seminary that if you're interested in being a parish pastor who, who raises up healthy congregations, you come to be trained at Trinity. And, and I think we could achieve that, but the seminary has to be willing to change and do things in new ways. And academicians aren't the easiest people to get to change. Um, so we're, we're swimming upstream against that. My last offer right now is, is with Trinity. And um, hopefully we can start in September having a gathering there uh, for new training, training some new pastors, getting involved with Banker Church, and then begin the, the curriculum conversation. But if they're not willing to do that, then I'm going to have to find a different seminary, hopefully that we could work with. Yeah, we've got Pat and Susan here. Well, Pat, you, go ahead, Pat. Um, my um, uh, vision though, is if you just get one seminary and the other ones are teaching the old stuff, they're all those new pastors are going out and it's just gonna be a sprinkling of say Trinity people. Right. Until you get all of them. Well, my concern is are we going to start a new, uh, I'm going to say denomination, I don't know what to call it, that come from Trinity and there's going to be something else coming from the rest of the seminary? Well, again, don't think denomination, right? Because well, even I with know Lutheran, what else to call it. Yeah, yeah. But, but I, I just want to be clear, even with Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, whatever, we're all kind of converging. Everything, we're all kind of converging on this cutting edge theology and ecclesiology that, that I wrote the book about and that you hear all about it at Abiding Hope. Um, that isn't about denominational lines or loyalty. It's, it, it really is about theology and how we view God. And so I think that, um, I think seminaries may be the last thing to come online, to be honest with you, be, be, because... Uh, all of the professors at the seminaries now were educated under a different teaching than what we're espousing. And so when do we start getting professors in that were raised up in this theology, right? We may be 10, 15 years away from that um, because the ones who are doing this theology primarily are practitioners. They're not seminarians. Seminarian, or seminary professors are not leading the charge in this movement. This movement is being led by practitioners. That's a really important point. Richard Rohr is not in a seminary. Richard Rohr leads the Center for Action and Contemplation. He's a practitioner. Uh, Brian McLaren is not a seminary professor. He's a practitioner. Um, um, Reggie McNeil, uh, I, I mean, just a long list of folks. These are, we're all practitioners. Um, Rob Bell, practitioner, not a seminary professor. So um, I, I think there's a, there's a divide. Because we practitioners, what, what's important to us is function. Are we functioning in a healthy way? Are people being transformed? Are lives being changed? Are people being drawn into Christ? That's what we care about. Professors care about the elegance of the message, right? They care about the system of theology or 
uh, whatever the, 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 the information that they're teaching, whether or not it can be applied is less of a concern to the professor and more of a concern to the practitioner. I'm all about what can be applied. If I, when I visit the seminary, I sit in classes, I hear stuff taught. And I'm like, that won't ever, that won't work in a congregation. You can teach that all you want. And I hear what you're saying and I get that would be great. It won't work. And, and here's why it won't work. Well, I know that because of 30 years of ministry in settings, whereas a professor may have had three years of, of parish ministry and then their whole career in the classroom. And so it, it, it's different. <clears throat> That's why we're trying to create this network where professors and practitioners come together and work together and listen to each other and learn from each other. Um, I would love to have a professor say, let me tweak your language here a little bit, Doug. You know, you, you say this this way. It would be better if you said it that way. Um, and, and, and let me help you with your theology a little bit. Let me, you know, you, you got A, C, and, and, and F. Let me fill in the other letters that will make this more holistic for you. And at the same time, I can be a resource to them saying, I know you love this concept. Like I have a professor friend right now who loves to teach about um, your, what's he call it? Your, your uh, genogram, your, your family tree history, right? And he spends the whole semester teaching about your genogram because that's gonna help you be a better pastor. And I'm like, maybe one paper on that would be helpful, but it, you're focusing on something that's really not going to teach somebody how to lead an organization. I get being self-aware matters, but you don't need a, a, a full semester class on this. That's, you're wasting, you're wasting the student's time. Um, and, but he loves that and he thinks it's so important. Okay, great, fantastic. Let's figure out how to work it in. But we got to get to organizational intelligence because that's what students need um, to be pastors of organizations, so congregations. All right. Uh, let's talk about theology a little bit since we're there. Did, were you able to read through the Abiding Hope Systematic Theology and Ecclesiology? Yeah. It's very concise and, and compact because I don't want it to be, I didn't want it to be a long document. And our staff uses this, uh, key leaders use this if they want to, they don't have to. Um, but I make it available for, you know, anyone who wants to see it. But this is true north for us theologically. So if a pastor preaches something that doesn't align with this, I have a conversation with him, right? Um, uh, and, and we make sure that we get it straightened out so that the theology that you're getting, doesn't matter who preaches at Abiding Hope, you're gonna get this theology, whether it's Doug, Jay, or Laura. This is the reason we don't have outside preachers come to Abiding Hope, because I can't guarantee they're gonna provide a, the theology that aligns with us. And our theology is very unique mm -hmm. and I guard it carefully. I don't mess around with it. It's really important to me because all it would take is just getting off center just a little bit. And then down the road, we find ourselves here. And so this is something that I am very careful with and, and guard. Um, I'll give you an example. We have, uh, we have somebody in our Wednesday morning men's group <clears throat> that has a relationship with a, a um, a staff person. I don't think he's a pastor, but I think he might be the youth person or I don't know what his ministry is at Bethany Lutheran Church over in uh, Cherry Hills. And that person sends out an email every week. And this person in our Wednesday morning men's Bible study, he, he reads those emails and he thinks they're the coolest thing. And he blasts them out to the group and, and to others, including me. And I read it it's not our theology. And so I've had to ask that person, please stop sending emails from other churches to our group because it's confusing people. And he's, well, I don't see what the problem is. I said, exactly. That's the problem. You don't see what the problem is. You don't see how that theology diverges from our theology. Uh, we're very precise in ours. That one is not. It's a feel-good theology. The, the messages that person sends out are you know, just let's just work harder. Let's just try to do better. Let's, you know, God loves us anyway. Let's just do the best we can. And when you read it superficially, it's like, oh, that's nice. It makes me feel good. It's not deep. It, 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 it's not getting to the death and resurrection, transformation, new creation, new humanity that the gospel calls us to proclaim. 
It's just, well, let's just try to do a little better today. Let's love another person today. Add us, you know, it's, it's, and you get a lot of that in churches where we just need to grow a little bit each day and God will be happy. No, we're called to die and be raised. We're called to die to ourselves and all that is ours in order to be recreated as the children of God we're created to be. And that's a very distinct message that's difficult to, to protect, but that's what I do. And so people get upset with me because I have to send the email that says, you can't do that anymore. You can't send other churches stuff to our people. You can't do it. If you want to send it to a couple of your friends or whatever, that's fine. But you can't use the Wednesday morning men's email group and just blast this stuff out. You cannot do that um, because it, it looks like it's coming from the church and it's not, and it doesn't align with our message. So that's, that's the hard work, you know, of, of um, maintaining true North and, um, ensuring that our message is, is clear, compelling, and relevant. So thoughts on anything you read in that material? I mean, is that where, um, let's see, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find it. Um, it's in the back. It's Appendix B. Oh, it's Appendix B. Okay. I mm -hmm. had questions, I think, on Appendix B. Okay, great. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Huh? Let me go, Barb. Let me, let me pull my sleeves up, Barb. Let yeah, me, okay. Let's get All right, yeah, me too. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, we looked, it's on 187. We look to Jesus as the Messiah King who brings an end to the old moral order governed by hierarchy, division, fear, death, in order to inaugurate a new moral order governed by oneness, inclusion, love, and life. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I know this much, a teeny tiny bit about Baha'i and about Islam, those guys too, they also preach that very same thing. Oh, isn't that amazing? Yeah. That, that's incredible. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know. Um, yes, yes, yes. Because that's what the spirit is doing. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is create is moving us in this direction. Which which God would you follow? Which spirit would you follow? Would you follow the God who says, I've come to separate everyone, to create lines and barriers between tribes? Or would you follow the God who says, I've come to destroy lines and barriers and to draw all into one tribe? To, yeah. to draw all what is what is advancement? Is advancement violence or is advancement peace? Is advancement death or is advancement life? What, what, is, what is the trajectory that is worth giving your life to and following? It's the trajectory of oneness. Mm -hmm. It's the trajectory of peace. It's the trajectory of well-being for all people, right? Well, mm -hmm. we Christians are just not waking up to that. Because throughout my life, I thought we're supposed to be divided. Because Lutherans are right and Catholics are wrong. And Lutherans are right and Presbyterians are wrong. And Lutherans are right and... Jews are wrong, right? And Muslims are wrong and Baha'is are wrong and everybody else is wrong. Well, if there's one God who people are perceiving maybe differently, but this God is real and the spirit of God is alive, then wouldn't that spirit be taking all the different groups and trying to move us in the same direction? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's what I believe. I, I really believe that all of these traditions are being influenced by God's spirit, by the divine and we're moving together versus away. Now, there are things that all of us will have to let go of in order to become one, but there also is an ability then to acknowledge what's different between us and respect that mm -hmm. and respect each other's differences, knowing that there's always gonna be differences and we still can be one. We still could be connected. Okay, yeah. because of this Appendix B, I really yeah. keyed into Appendix B because it was totally cool. I have highlighted so many things in Appendix B. But, um, and I think for this, reading this book and especially this appendix, it has given me a more clear vision of in black and white so I can refer back to it, what abiding hope is. Because I questioned for so many years, what the heck, nobody could give me a uh, uh, definition of heart, hands, and feet. What does that actually mean? The heart, hands, and feet. Be the heart, hands, and feet. This is pointing out what the heart, hands, and feet meant. Now, maybe because I'm slow in processing, who knows? But I, I have thoroughly, really gotten a ton out of this book. 
Thank you. It's hard to preach the book in one sermon. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it takes a book, right? It took a book for you to get it, Barb, because yeah. this isn't easy, simple stuff. It really is complicated. And we're swimming upstream against, I won't say how many years old you are, but we're swimming upstream against 50, 60, 70, 80 years of personal history in the church that now we're, we're, we're pivoting. And it's like, wait a second, time out. Why? What? Who said? How can we do this? So I appreciate your, your, um, your transparency there. Okay, yeah. now, but what I'm wondering is, because this is our vision, right? it may not be other churches, denominations, whatever's mm -hmm. vision. So we're trying to enculturate other, I guess, Yes, people? So, so let me say this, I believe, I believe the work we're doing now aligns with scripture more than anything we've ever done. I, I, you know, so I intentionally, as you go through Appendix B and read, read the um, Abiding Hope Systematic Theology and Ecclesiology, you'll notice all of the scriptural references, right? Yeah. You go under the, who is God? Look at all the scripture references there. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the Missio Dei, God's mission, scripture references. I, I was intentional in, in making this based in scripture because um, a lot of our, 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 our doctrine has evolved beyond scripture. And I'm trying to return us back to what, what was the early church really doing? And, and who did they understand Jesus to be? And why were they giving their lives to this, even though they would be persecuted and potentially killed or their families would be killed for being Christian? Why was this so important to them? And, and so I think... To your point, your question about what about others? This is just our vision or theology. I don't believe it's abiding hopes. I call it the abiding hope systematic theology and ecclesiology. But this didn't come from me. This came from this movement, right? Richard Rohr, Rob Bell, uh, Brian McLaren, all these people that have been in the same process I've been in, getting back to the Greek, looking at scripture through a different lens. Suddenly things are popping that we've never seen before because we had a, a lens that didn't let us interpret it this way. So um, I think what's going to happen, Barb, is this, this movement will continue to evolve. Um, it's just getting started. We're just on the front ends of this. And, um, and the Spirit's driving it. We're, Abiding Hope's not driving it. The Spirit's driving it. We're just participating and trying to pay attention to what the Spirit's doing. Okay, now I have my last bone to pick here. Okay, okay. all right. Okay, page 193. Yeah. Um, we see God's vision clearly through the meal in that all who are gathered are invited to participate, thus representing the oneness of humanity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, being a gentle women's liver. Yeah. Okay. Because at that time, back in the day, the women were the preparers of the food and the servers. They were not invited to the meal. I thought that was uncool. Well, what are you referring to? I'm referring to the Last Supper. Right. But how do you know the women weren't invited to the yeah. meal? How do you know well, they weren't I invited don't, to the meal? But how do you know that they were? Well, well we don't know, but you're okay. I'm not the one making a condemning judgment statement. You are the uh, one saying it's not cool, but we don't even know if that happened. There were women there. Surely they ate. Probably culturally, men and women didn't eat in the same space. The women probably ate in a different room than the men were eating, but they ate the same food and they they were present. There's no question they were present. Uh, Jesus very much valued women, and um, but but um, it's important to understand Jesus didn't write the Bible, right? And he didn't paint the picture of the Last Supper. No, he didn't. <laughs> and and it probably wasn't like Leo painted, where they all sat on one side of the table yeah. and it was just men, you know? Yeah. Um, so I hear what you're saying, I and I'm with you with the the light. Um, feminist. I, I stand with you in that. Um, the Baha'i the, the Baha tradition has said a lot about this. I think that Jesus very clearly addressed the, the question of uh, gender um, by how he included women. He reached out to women. He touched women publicly, which was against the law. He did a lot of things to break down those barriers. The first apostles were women who were sent from, from the tomb to tell the, the men that, that he was raised. And, um, but the world wasn't ready to hear it yet. 
Okay, and yeah. and it, it it's taken until later. One of the teachings, uh, core teachings of the it, within Baha'i, is all of the the knowledge is taught through all of the prophets. Mm -hmm. It's not that they just teach on parts of the, the wisdom or knowledge of the divine. It's all taught, but the world is only ready to hear things at certain times. Yeah. So we we can only hear what we're ready to hear through Moses. We can only hear what we're ready to hear through Jesus. We can only hear what we're ready to hear through Muhammad. We can only hear what we're ready to hear through. Um, uh, uh, Baha'u'llah. And so it's it, the message is always there, but the world's only ready for certain things at certain times. I think we're suddenly ready for this gender, race, ethnic conversation, but it's taken a really long time for us to get there. And yeah, so it's been years. As individuals as well as the world. Amen. 10 years ago, I wasn't ready to hear this message. No, no. Ten no, years ago, I was, sadly. You've been waiting. You know? Yeah, and yeah. I am full-blown going ahead, moving on, you know, that whole thing. And then what with the Phyllis Tickle book about mm -hmm. every 500 years, things change, some things drop off. Fine. Good. Yeah, that's where we, that's, that's what it. we're seeing. Guess yeah. what? We're, we're getting to participate in it right now. Yeah. We are pioneers in, in the emergence of what the Spirit is doing. And in the church and in the world today. Susan was trying to get in <coughs> about six times. I have, I have a couple of different questions. One of them was with no. regard to, so what you're saying is all the different religions are, it's the same God. They're just different ways of expressing our belief or our faith system. So I'm very involved in multi-faith work and uh, have been through my, my whole ministry. I'm part of the multi-faith leaders forum. I'm on, I'm on the executive team for that here in Denver. I was on the executive team of the University of Denver Religious Advisory Council when it existed. And now we're the multi-faith leaders forum. And um, I believe religion, the word religion comes from the Latin re, R-E, ligio. It's where we get the word ligament. It means to connect. Religion means to reconnect. That's literally the meaning of the word, to reconnect, reconnect with God, reconnect with creation, reconnect with humanity. And I think all valid religions seek to do that. They, they seek to reconnect people. They're valid religions. There's extremism. There's, there are extremist Christians. There are extremist Jews. There are ex extremist Muslims, whatever. But, but valid faith community, for me, is always about a sincere and genuine desire to discern God's movement and, and what God is doing in the world. A sincere and genuine desire uh, for peace, not just for self, but for the world, for all. Uh, eradication of violence. Uh, all the stuff I was talking about before, right? That, that, and I see this in Buddhism. I see this in Islam. I see this in Judaism. I see this in Baha'i. I see this in these other faiths that, that I have relationships with and walk alongside. I, I, how do I say this? Um, I am unapologetically Christian. The reason I am Christian is because I believe that um, God, as revealed through the Christ, is the purest revelation of the divine that we have. That's why I'm a Christian. Doesn't mean I discount Muhammad. Doesn't mean I discount Moses. Doesn't mean I discount these uh, Buddhism. There's a lot of wisdom in those traditions. But I believe the revelation of the Christ is the clearest revelation of the divine that we have. And that um, Christian theology that, that we're articulating is the best option for creating reconciliation and wellness throughout our world. Mm -hmm. I think if people understand that we are part of God, part of each other, interconnected um, from the beginning, and that's what the Christ is. The Christ isn't just a guy. The Christ is God's vision for the creation. All things dwell in the Christ. That's our greatest opportunity. That provides us the greatest opportunity for holistic, cosmic reconciliation, wholeness, and wellness. That's why I'm a Christian. Now, I happen to be raised Christian and didn't choose it, Lutheran, all of that, but I now choose it, and that's why. And, and so uh, I don't go to my meetings and have to defend Christianity. I don't do that. Um, we, we, when we get together, we talk about how we can work together to change the world. 
That's what we do with the multi-faith stuff. Um, we support each other. We stand with each other. What we're discussing this week is this shooter in Boulder has a Muslim name. You know what that means? That means that the Muslim community is now going to be under, under attack. There's going to be death threats. Uh, they're going to be scared. They're going to have to have police officers at their mosques if they gather. Um, and people will go underground because of this. And so what's our job? Our job is to stand with them. Our job is to take a stand and say, when, the, when that violence happens, it's not okay. Uh, it shouldn't just be up to the Muslim community to say it's not okay. We should be saying it's not okay to persecute Muslim people. And, um, and, and so I see our role in the multi-faith as supporting each other, understanding each other, respecting each other, respecting our differences, but still choosing to be one together. And that's, that's how I engage in the work. So I don't, there was a time early in my ministry when I was really arrogant. Can you believe I was more arrogant than that? Um, when I was really arrogant and I believed my job was to prove that Christianity was right and the others were wrong. Um, and I don't think like that anymore. Um, yeah, but I think that was the thinking back then as well. It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Well, and it still is for a lot of people. Like the, the one scripture that I feel like gets thrown out so much um, that makes us right is... Um, I'm I am the way, the, the truth, truth, and the, the life. life. No one comes to the no Father. No one comes to me. the Father except through me. See? See? How did I know that, Susan? Exactly. But here's what it says. The Christ is speaking. All life came into being through me. There is no life except through me. I am, I originated in the Father, and the way to the Father is through me, through the creation, through all that God has, has created. How can you get to, to, to the Father? How, do, how can you get to God outside of the creation? You can't, right? And that's what the Christ is saying in that moment. We hijacked that that passage to make it be unless you believe in jesus you're going to hell for all eternity so muslims jews baha'is buddhists they're all condemned and and we take that john 3 17 those who aren't believing are, are condemned already no that's not what it says you know that, that those who don't believe in jesus are going to hell already it's it, see it, it's already been figured out for them that's not what it says or means so that's why Changing the lens through which we read scripture really, really matters. And this is why I'm very careful. All it would take is one pastor kind of accidentally in a sermon hinting that, you know, uh, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Hinting that, you know, unless you believe in Jesus, you're going to, you're not saved. All it would take is that. And what happens is 60% of the people, 80% of the people sitting out there already believe that. And you just fueled that. You just, you just fueled their, their misguided thinking that you have to believe in Jesus to go to heaven after you die. That is not what the Jesus, Bible says. The, per, the person of Jesus. The person of Jesus, right. Right, right. And person I think that's, that's the difference in this. Um, Amen. My other question was on page 189, yeah. where you're talking about what are human beings and that first bullet point, mm -hmm. um, be aware of self and the other. What is the yeah. other that you're referring I am, to? I am self, you are other. So um, anything that is not you is other. Okay, anything that is not you is other. There was a wonderful book years ago written by um, Rabbi, I, I, I have Harold Kushner in my brain, but that's not correct. The book is called I Thou by Martin Buber. Martin Buber, I Thou. And what the reason Buber said the title is I, thou, is I is subject and, and thou is a subject, right? And um, what we do in relationships to everything, like this book, I'm the subject, the book is an object that serves me. I'm the subject, I use the book as an object to serve me. Well, guess what? We do that with people. We objectify people. We objectify stuff. So what we're trying to get to is a society, as a culture, where we're I thou. That, that when I meet you, I know I'm a subject. I'm real. I'm a human. And so are you. And so I treat you with the same love and respect that I want to be treated with as a subject. I don't use you. I don't manipulate you. I don't see you as something 
to be objectified for my pleasure or my well-being, right? And so other, when I use the term other, I'm talking about anything that's not you. Well, in my spirituality, my spiritual journey, spiritual development, I used to think that the, the thou was just people. Now I'm recognizing the thou is everything. It's the trees, it's nature, it's animals. I can't objectify anything because everything is precious to God. Everything is a subject. I can't just go cut down trees because I want to cut down trees or use them for myself. I have to think about the value of the trees. This is where I love Native American spirituality where they recognize the spirit present in all things. And, you know, when, when Native Americans would kill a deer or something to feed their, their community, they would thank the deer. They would thank the great spirit. They would acknowledge the life that's in the deer. How, where'd that deer come from? Came from a other deer, but it also came from the berries that it eats, the grasses that it eats. All of that is in that deer. And the Native American had respect for all of that. That's I thou, right? So I am self other are the things beyond me. Does that make sense? And so that first bullet is in uh, when we are created in Imago Dei in the image of God, a key component of that is our self-awareness. I know I'm a self, but I also know you're a self. And I also know the creation is a self and that I, I function and process then in relationship to things that are not me in a way that builds all. And that's a, that's a huge spiritual shift. But I, we can do that. Dogs can't do that. Cats can't do that. Um, trees can't do that. Human beings have the capacity to be self-aware and to be other aware. So and we to have live a greater responsibility. That. Amen. Because of that. Uh, when, we, when we were traveling in Peru, it was interesting to see um, the Catholic Church, how it's change it's different there than the catholic church in what I, my experience is because they have incorporated mother earth from the incan tradition yep. there um and we we learned things about that while we were yep. visiting there so it's, it's interesting to see how even the catholic church can be different and is absolutely moving and changing we did a disservice when we when we missionized the world Right. So as the conquistadors came to the new world and we came, we went to Hawaii, read um, Michener's Hawaii. I mean, if you, I mean, it's this big, but uh, really, and when he gets to the part about the, um, the missionaries, he talks about how the missionaries came and, and the Hawaiians, there's Rogers and my brother. And, and, <laughs> and, and the, the, the missionaries, the missionaries came to Hawaii and there are the people wearing very little clothing, right? Because it's Hawaii for goodness sake. <laughs> And, and how they, they, make, they put wool dresses and clothing on these Hawaiian women and, and men because the body must be covered up. Did you, well, when you live in, in Norway, yeah, you better cover the body up or, yeah. or Northern Germany, give me a break. But they took European values and put them on these folks around the world and called it Christian. Mm -hmm. What they should have done was come in and identify the indigenous religions that are there. And then begin to speak about the Christ as yeah. part of the indigenous religion and transform folks. That's what St. Paul did in Greece when he was at the Acropolis. He didn't come in and argue with them how their religions were wrong. He went into the Acropolis, went to the, the bust or the statue of the unknown God and said, let me tell you about this one. I know all of these, but you probably don't know about this one. Let me tell you who this one is. And he told him about Christ. And so we, we've screwed a lot of cultures up by how we do Christianity. And, and, and we, we've said, you're wrong. And this is the right way and the right way normed in Europe, for goodness sake. Now, any other questions? Thanks for you guys are raising really good questions about this. I'm excited and, and honored that you took the time to read it and that you found things intriguing enough to, to question. Okay, I definitely have I have to, yeah, okay. What is a layman's definition of hermeneu, hermeneu I can't even say it, hermeneutic, hermeneutic? Her, hermeneutic, yeah. Yeah. So it's the lens through which you interpret. Um, oh, it, lens through, okay, that makes sense, okay. That's what hermeneutic is. So Hermes so that, was, in, 
Yeah, Hermes was the messenger god. So every any, anything you read, you read a novel, you read through your lens. You you read through your perspective. Um, uh, it doesn't matter what literature you read. All of us have a hermeneutic in how we how we read it. Um, and scripture, because we do have to interpret scripture, we don't just read it to see what it says. We're always interpreting. Hermeneutics are very very important. And but to be honest, most clergy even. Um, are ignorant about their her hermeneutic. They're ignorant about their lens. W when you see a church that says, they have a sign up that says a, a Bible preaching or Bible believing church or something like that, they don't, they don't think they have a hermeneutic. They're, they're reading it and, and they, they think they're interpreting it based on exactly what it says. But they, they come in, into the reading of the text with a, a prefixed lens that then affects how they're interpreting. And that's, I think, to be honest, as a theologian, as a um, scholar, as, a, as an author, you have to name, you have to know what your hermeneutic is and name it so that people go, oh, that's why you interpret this text to mean this, and I interpret it to mean that, because my hermeneutic is different from your hermeneutic. Somebody who believes in, in punitive substitutionary atonement theory that humans are bad god is angry and god you know jesus had to die to appease the angry god who needed a blood offering to be appeased they're going to read these passages very differently than we're reading these passages and, and that's what i'm trying to get people toward is know your hermeneutic know what your lens is um because that's going to affect how you interpret scripture okay last question but it's threefold the definition of messianic, apocalyptic, eschatology, but in layman's terms, not in biblical or erudite terms, just down home, bottom line terms. There is an anointed one who was sent into the world to disclose God's vision for the cosmos, okay? And the outcome, the ultimate outcome. So the eschaton, the eschatological part is the final outcome. Okay. So what I believe is that Jesus came, the anointed one, to reveal, disclose, that's apocalypsis, God's vision of oneness and love and life for all. Okay. And that's the ultimate end. That when Jesus was put to death and raised anew, that's the actual final outcome of history. Death and resurrection is the final outcome of history. And, and in that, God revealed to humanity that love and life went. That's, that's apocalyptic eschatology. Apocalypse, that's messianic apocalyptic eschatology. Fabulous. That's a fabulous definition. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Back to hermeneutics. <laughs> what? Uh, I'm, Back I'm, to hermeneutics, she said. Oh, okay. I'm of a generation, if the teacher says something, it must be true. Right. So in seminary, many in my age group, the, the uh, professors interpreted what you were supposed to believe and therefore you did. And that's what you tell everybody else because that's what you see is, is true. You don't use your own head. Right. You, you use somebody else's who probably read somebody else's. Right. Pat, thanks for bringing that up because I... The greatest compliment I receive is when somebody expresses that what they've learned at Abiding Hope has helped them to read scripture better, yeah. understand it better, and apply it better into their lives. When somebody tells me, I I've become better at reading, interpreting scripture, and applying things, and it it's been transformative for me, I feel like I I've done my job. You know, it's we we've gotten this across. Um Faith and um, theology are in process. They're evolving and always will be. And we have to understand that. Uh, to think that we can get to a place, a static place, where we say, this is what it means to believe in God. This is what it means to be a, 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 a Jesus person. To think that we get to a static place where it never changes again is naive and foolish um we're as as a race we're evolving and we're evolving very quickly actually 
Um, one of the reasons I think we're in so much pain in society is because of technology. Um, if you go back in the 50s and you read Jacques Ellul, E-L-L-U-L, -L -L, French philosopher, Christian, who talked about the dangers of technology, and he was right. And, uh, but you can't stop it. You can't stop the development. We were not ready for cell phones. We were not ready for, for smartphones. I don't even know where mine is. I must have left it upstairs. We weren't ready for smartphones. Um, we don't know how to use them properly. We're using them for destructive uh, purposes. All of these analogs with social media that, that surround you only with people and, and things that think like you do is really dangerous. That we only hear viewpoints that, that align with us is really scary stuff. Um, and we've got kids bullying kids and, 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 and people feeling like they don't matter because not enough people like their posts and all of this. We weren't ready. And we, we haven't figured out how to use these things in a constructive way. It's still really destructive. And so we're evolving faster than we can manage as a human race. We really are. And, and what hasn't kept up with, the, with the, the science of technology is the science of faith. We haven't kept up with it. We haven't kept up with applying values to how we deal with technology. Mm -hmm. I've said this before, the line in um, Michael Crichton's book, Jurassic Park, where the, the mathematician uh, says, uh, you were so uh, impressed with what you could do, you never stopped to ask, should you, mm -hmm. right? And so we need the values to align with our technological advancements to figure out should we be doing these things? If we can create a Death Star that uses lasers to vaporize other planets, should we do that? Just because we can, should we? Do our values say that's what we need? You know, a Death Star? Or, or are there things in society we just choose not to do because they don't align with our values? How do we unite the, the values of, of spirituality with the science of, of technology. And when uh, going back to the Baha'is, I know wait, I've, the Baha'is in Tennessee were my best friends. So that's why I know so much. Uh, Abdul Baha, or was it Shofi Effendi? One of the two came and spoke in New York. And, and this is, was the very point of the conversation, was advocating that America is so rich and we have so much technology. Do we have the values? that can help us make the choices and decisions for how we use our wealth and how we use our technology. Do we have that? And what if we bring the technology of the West with the spirituality of the East together and, and, and live that way? We think we could probably create a pretty good world. But if you just have science and technology and you don't have the values and the spirituality, we find ourselves in the mess we're in right now. Good luck with that. Thanks, Raj. <laughs> Just to com a comment, um, I'm one of those that's now trying to look at scripture with a different eye. And just, it's not easy. You know, uh, it, it's not easy. I don't think you can do it alone, Pat. I think, I think you really need to be in community um, with people who have the other lens, right? The new lens and, and can just help us break it down. Um, you know, I wrote in the, in the epilogue about, I want to see conferences in the ELCA. We're, we're in the Metro South conference of the Rocky mountain Synod. So there are about 13, 14 congregations. I don't even know anymore. Some have closed. Um, I don't know how many we have in our conference here, but we get together once a week. In fact, I'll be on a call with the other pastors here when I'm done with this, this morning. And all we do is talk just about how you doing? How are things yeah. every week? I'm like, what are we doing guys? What are we doing? We should be having focused conversation about theology, about the church and, and who God is calling us to be and how to create cultures of vitality and health and wellness. We don't ever talk about that. We, we just, we have small talk. How's your family? How, how are things, you know? Uh, what's going on? Well, give us some highlights of what's going on at your church. That's not helpful. It's not helpful. So I don't go to those meetings often because, first of all, we have four pastors at <laughs> Abiding Hope 
plus a, a lot of really other gifted staff people, we have our own kind of conference collegial group at the church. But I get frustrated because we're not going anywhere. We're not, we're not engaging in that deep conversation. To your point, Pat, it's really hard. It's not, it's not kind of hard. It's really hard to have that hermeneutical shift. I, it happened to me through a doctoral program, right? I mean, think about that. Four years of, of very focused doctoral level work for me to, to really be able to articulate what this new lens is and, and, and how to use it in a healthy way and how to draw other people into it. Past, we, most pastors are just trying to survive week in, week out. And don't when we get together, they're tired. We don't have the energy and we don't engage in the deep level of conversation. And I'm thinking most conferences are that way. Um, I don't think that there are many that are really getting together to do this kind of hard work so that we can be shaped and formed to be the effective leaders in our context. There's an important aspect of it for me in <laughs> shift how I think about all of this, and that's to allow myself to grieve what yeah. I'm putting away. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a really good yeah. statement, Sue. Really good statement. You know, I um, didn't get to do it this year. This was the first year. I'm gonna, look, I'm getting teary just thinking about this. First year of my life, I wasn't in church on Christmas Eve. Yeah. Mm. First year in my life. Me too. I wasn't in church on Christmas Eve. And I have fabulous memories in Pennsylvania, in Tennessee, of midnight service, holding candles, singing Silent Night, the accompany, accompanying uh, musicians fade away. We sing a cappella for a, a verse. Tears in everyone's eyes. Something about that experience that just, mm. the world stops and, and we're joined together with our parents and grandparents and great grandparents in the past. And we're looking into the future with a hopeful heart, a spirit, and didn't get to do that this year. When, when I'm leading worship on Christmas Eve and standing up front holding a candle, and that this is the stuff that's in, the, in my head. You know, you wonder what the pastor's thinking. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm remembering my grandparents, my great grandparents, my aunts and uncles that are gone. Um, I'm thinking about my kids in the future. Will my grandkids hold candles and sing Silent Night on Christmas Eve? There, there's power to that, but it's gone. We don't even have a late Christmas Eve service at Abiding Hope anymore. Um, people stopped coming. It wasn't as important anymore. It wasn't as valuable anymore. And to your point, Sue, I have to let that go. Mm -hmm. I, have to, I, have to, I have to let the memory live in me mm -hmm. and knowing that we may we'll probably never get back to that. It's gone. That served a time period, whatever. And it was, in, it was transformative for me, but I have to let it go. And because if I try to hold on to it, remember we, we, Jay and I both preached recently about you don't hold things with a fish, you hold things in an open hand so that you're not attached. You know, you just hold it that way and it can gently be let go. Um, if, if, if I don't do that, all I do is torture myself, torment myself. That's the hard part. Right, right. So um, what's fascinating is a lot of the times where people get mad at me for changes we've made at the church, nobody's grieving the changes more than I am, mm. right? That I've had to get myself through this. I'm a traditionalist at heart. I really am. Um, I, I love traditional church. That's what I grew up in. That's what I'm familiar with. Um, but it's not relevant in a lot of ways anymore. And, and so I've had to change and adapt and do things differently. And it's, it's for a missional reason. It's not because it's Doug's preference. People assume just because I'm doing something, that's what I prefer. That's what I want. It's not true. I'm the leader. I have to do things and behave in certain ways that lead the congregation in a direction. And it's not about what I think or want. And when folks come and they, they're mad and I say, I'm with you. And they're like, no, you're not because you're doing it this other way. They don't understand that I've been, I've been working on this now for months and it comes as a surprise to you. 
but I've had to go through that process of grief myself in order to, to get to this new place. I'm grieving like crazy that Laura's leaving. Um, she's terrific and, and I love her a lot and I wanna see her be successful. I'm a little nervous. She and I talked this week and I said, is this right? Is this the right thing? You know, is, is this, and she's convinced it is and I am too. I believe in, in the spirit, I believe in her. And, um, but it's scary, you know, to, to let her go and um, like, man, we're never going to find somebody who can preach like Laura. What are we going to do? And, and, and that's the kind of stuff in me right now. But she's, Laura deserves a shot. And, and she's 36 years old. And now's the right time. And she engaged in a very serious discernment process that I respect and value. Um, and, and so we, we got to let her go. And it, you know, it's hard, but it's life. It's just life. How many of you have had to let your kids go? You know, oh, you yeah. gotta yeah. gotta let your grandkids go. You gotta. Yeah. You hate it. You don't like yeah. it. It's scary. Um, just um, probably shouldn't tell you this. I'll tell you this after I turn the the recording off. I don't want what I'm about to tell you to be on the recording. So um, <laughs> it's it's eleven twenty five. Any other final questions or or, or reflections? Yeah, just a reflection. You have been terrific. The book is terrific. Thank you so much for uh, putting up with all our questions. Well, especially <laughs> my questions. Um, you are very loved, very valued, very whatever. Okay. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Barb, that was very sweet of you to say that. Thank you very much. Wait till my sister sees Amen. this part of the video. <laughs> and I, I just want to say that um, because of the process that we've been through in our family, my husband and I, in trying to listen to what God was telling us to do. Um, I'm grateful that we we found Abiding Hope as where we're supposed to be now, where God's led us to be, so. Thank you, Susan. Yeah, we're glad you're at Abiding Hope too because we're, we're, we're better because you're with us and, um, uh, you're a blessing to us, even though you haven't been in the worship center I yet. Say, I haven't been there that long. You don't know yet, for sure. So you might want to withhold that part. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sensing you got as much chutzpah as I do. So we could have some good yeah. conversations. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Any thoughts, comments, reflections, questions about anything I didn't cover? All right. I'm going to turn the recording off. Don't leave yet. Don't leave. Uh, I'm going to leave. So, uh, Professor... Douglas, may the force be with you. Amen, my brother. I love you, Roger. Uh.